back to this I-24 News Evening Edition. This is the one-on-one. -on -one. Well, now, the mystery of covert operations and life behind enemy lines has been the subject of numerous books and movies. Well, today in the studio, we have a very special guest, Yiftach Reicher Atir, who served as commander of an Israeli Defense Force commando unit and the head of special operations of IDF military intelligence. Well, in these roles, he was a participant in some of Israel's most well-known intelligence missions. After Life in the Shadows, Mr. Reicher Atir has written three books on the subject. Most recently published is The English Teacher, which I know we have here today. Thank you for joining us tonight. Thank you very much for having me. So wonderful to have you in the studio. Uh, the topic of the day here, talking about uh, the events surrounding the assassination of Imad Munia, a more recent uh, chapter in Israeli intelligence work. Uh, you served for many years. I know you retired in 1994. That's uh, correct. So I, I don't know Imad Mourinia personally. I never heard of him until he was assassinated. Uh, good job. I don't know who did it, but it's a uh, good job and he deserved it. But I don't know him. So, you know, I know in your, the beginning of your new book now, just to touch on that a little bit, you have a, a letter to the readers uh, where you mention, uh, you make a point to say that you're out of the service now. It's freed you up somewhat to, to write uh, more freely, free of the censorships that you yourself may have imposed on your, on your writing. Uh, that necessarily comes with this uh, portion of your life. You know, how, how, do you actually feel free to write, you know, in these stories? Are you, do you feel you have a free hand when you're telling these stories, or are you still uh, telling somewhat of a fiction on top of it? Well, you see, I, even though I retired 20 years ago, I'm still in the reserved force, but then, you know, I'm not in the service. I still feel part of the organization, and I see I'm still very much obliged to the organization, to the system, if you, you would say so. And I was not free to write what, what I know, and I was not free to write what I wanted to write because of the secrets, because of uh, many other aspects of uh, the, the real world. This is uh, fiction. Sure. This is fiction. But, and uh, I wrote this letter to the readers in order to explain to them a little bit about the questions that someone like me, who was part of the organization, is facing when he decides to write that kind of book. Because I, I knew that uh, my friends, whether they are still in the service or out of the service, would raise a brow and would say, aha, he served for so many years, now he writes about that. So I tried to explain part of it. And the other part was about the censorship, which uh, uh, they gave me hell. <laughs> More difficult than in the service. Well, let's talk about uh, the, a main operation here. For example, uh, one that you were involved in 1988, the assassination of Abu Jihad in Tunisia. Uh, can you tell us, as we're talking about the assassination of Munia also, what goes into the planning of a large operation like that? Can you walk us through some of the main steps that the intelligence operatives use to get to that point where you actually take out your target? Well, uh, first, I, I, I can't tell you. I can tell you, but then I will have to kill you all, OK? <laughs> Uh, since uh, I assume that these kind of operations are still in, are, are planned or are being executed from time to time, but I can tell you about the problems that uh, the, the intelligence force or whoever is going to do it is facing. First of all, this is a question of intelligence. You, you need to know everything. You need to know everything. You need to know if, if it's a, a person, where does he live, where does he walk, what, what he is doing all the time. Because uh, just assume the Abu Jihad operation, he was there in Tunisia. And uh, now Israel admits that uh, it was involved in his, uh, his killing if you want to say it in this world. And uh, you have to be there at uh, one minute with all the forces, and you, you must be sure that he is there. So this is a first problem. The other problem is what kind of protection he has. 
uh, guards, electric, uh, electronic systems, cameras, uh, and then the third circle, the local police, the army, what might happen if, what, if. This Especially is, operating in a foreign country. Uh, with those added, operating in a foreign country specifically yes. with the added difficulties of that. Yeah, also you, you have to consider diplomatic questions because uh, admit it or not, you are operating in a foreign country. So uh, this is a very large operation that starts from the intelligence. The other aspect is preparation of the troops. You have to prepare troops, soldiers, uh, that know exactly what to do. They don't, you don't have a second chance there. You know, we are here in the interview. If something goes wrong, we can do it again. Not there. There is you have one minute, that's all. No second chances, you're saying, no especially in chance. such high profile, high risk operations as the assassination of a foreign operative in another country. I imagine that. Well, let's talk about another incident here, the rescue of Air France passengers uh, who were taken hostage in 1976 and taken to Entebbe in Uganda. What was your involvement with that rescue operation? Well, at that time, I was uh, the second of command of uh, Sayeret Matkal. I'm not sure that there is a right English word for that, but I'm sure that like the Mossad. The top now, commando unit now, uh, yes, within, now the, within the paratroopers a, of the Israeli yeah. Defense Force, right? It's a, it, it's a top uh, intelligence uh, a unit uh, that is involved with many commando operations and many special operations that are still classified. I was a second in command at that time. and. Uh, when we heard about the, uh, the kidnapping of the uh, airplane, we all rushed to uh, Lud Airport. Then now it's Ben Gurion Airport. Then it was called Lud Airport, and we waited for the airplane to to arrive. And then we we had a plan how to. Uh, go there and rescue the hostages. Well, speaking of the plan, if I can cut you off there. Yes. Uh, some of these operations, if not most of these operations, are planned with very little notice, very short notice, correct? I mean, sometimes you have just a day or something to prepare a massive operation similar to this rescue. Is that right? You are absolutely right. Because uh, if you compare this operation to the Abu Jihad operation, this is totally different. For the Abu Jihad operation, you prepare yourself until you're ready. For a rescue operation, you don't have that it's responsive. Time. You're you're responding to something that's right. happened out there. So actually, we had uh, about 48 hours to get prepared to the operation, but I would like to emphasize a very important uh, point, which for me I think it's the main issue. All the units that took part of, of this operation were ready. The air force were ready to take us over there. The soldiers. The themselves were ready. So even though 20, uh, 48 hours it's not much time, we had enough time to prepare ourselves and of course uh, the results are the results. So fantastic rescue yeah, of, we of the hostages there and, and of course uh, with your commander being killed in the, in the operation there, uh, Yoni Netanyahu. Uh, I, I imagine that was a, uh, a very difficult aspect of that mission in particular, uh, to lose your commander. You said you were in the second in command of the operation? No, I, I was not the second of command in, of the operation itself. The operation itself, um, another officer, Muki Betzer, was the second of command of uh, Yoni Netanyahu. Uh, Muki uh, knew Entebbe. He was there as uh, an advisor some years before. And he was very much involved in all the preparation of the, this operation, so it was natural that he will he will be the second of command. I was one of the uh, commanders there, a small force, very effective. We did our job. We came back. It's very sad that Yoni was killed, and it took uh, the part of the the joy of the success of the operation, but. We, are, we were professional soldiers. We knew, we knew all the risks, and he, uh, he paid with his life 
for the success of this operation. Let's talk about yourself on a personal level, being involved in a mission of that caliber and the many other things you've done in your career. On a personal level, how does, how does one prepare themselves for this? Obviously, it has to be the right type of person to even approach this career. But at the time, as a young man involved in that operation in 1976 at Entebbe, did you see yourself as someone who would be involved for a long haul for a career? What did, what did well, it take from you? How did it feel at that point? You know, what led you to that? Well, I was born on a kibbutz. I was a kibbutznik of the Shomer Atzair in the Negev. It was, uh, I, I was absolutely uh, sure that I will go to one of the fighting uh, units to be in the front line. At that time, and I think even today, every young guy who is a Zionist and he wants uh, Israel to be like the, the country he wants it to be, uh, is uh, volunteering. So I volunteered, and one thing took to another. And uh, one principle is, was very important then, it, and it is very important now. If there is a risk, I don't want anybody else to take that risk for me. I will do it. Nobody else will do it. It's a form of responsibility that you feel as someone who's capable uh, to fill that role. And, and you mentioned something very interesting to me before this interview here. You talk about the struggle uh, to achieve the peace, as you referred to it here. Can you expand on that? Tell me what you mean by that. We try to live more life. We know exactly... A moral life. You're moral saying. life, yes. right. We, we know exactly the differences between good and bad, right and wrong. We are here in Israel because we are Zionist and because there is no other place for the Jewish people. Then we are right. This is, we are here not because someone gave us this country, not because we were here for hundreds of years, because it was the right thing to do and it was, it was justified. Now, when we try to live our life here, I want to think and I want to feel that I'm doing the right thing. The right thing is for me living a more life, not only myself and my family and my kids and my grandchildren, but also as a country, as a nation, because we are, I am part of that nation. I pay taxes, I belong here, I live here. I want it to be moral. So you're saying the, the moral aspect of these difficult decisions that are taken. This is, this is an underlying theme to the way that the intelligence service operates. They're making these decisions based on what they think is the right thing to do. Uh, absolutely. Absolutely. Let me give you an example. When we planned uh, uh, the Abu Jihad operation, it was very easy to go there and to kill everyone and to shoot everywhere. If you look at the results of the operation, the soldiers, very brave, young men, they came in, they killed only him, they didn't kill his family, and they, they could do it, but they didn't do it even they knew the risk. You know, his wife could have had a gun in her clothes, a, a, a child could do something to them. It, it was a moral thing to hit only him, only him, and you have this kind of moral issues every time you plan an operation, every time. Let's talk about your new book uh, briefly here. It goes into uh, the personal life of some, it gets a little personal with some of the characters, I would say. And I think it highlights <coughs> some of the nature of somebody who goes into this line of work, where you have to say goodbye to your life as you knew it. You have to keep secrets from those people closest to you. Uh, how did you handle that? And in reference to your book, uh, how, did that, how did you put that feeling into this new book? And we can show the book here uh, for the camera. Yeah, if you'll I'll like. show the book. Absolutely. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I'll show the book. I tried for 249 pages to talk about what you said. Mm -hmm. Uh, the, the, the life of a secret agent, uh, a combatant, as we call him, is he's not a spy, or she's not a spy, she's a combatant. She's an Israeli, that instead of going to the front line here, she operates beyond the front line, but as a soldier, soldier of a different type. And she had, she has to keep so many secrets that 
uh, it becomes very, very difficult because she has to to play outside all the time, like she has two uh, identities in her, and it's very, very difficult. So it's a, and uh, a, a it's dual hard existence to do. in a way. Pardon? A dual existence where you have two lives essentially, or correct. more, or more correct. perhaps. Well, thank you very much for being here today. Unfortunately, we're out of time. Iftah Reichert here again. Thank you very much. Thank you. And thank you for joining us here in the evening edition today. Be sure to join us again tomorrow at the same time. Good night.